In this tutorial, we're going to cover an improved petroleum boiler powered by a volcano. Uh, a regular volcano will run this design forever. You don't actually need to do any maintenance, no digging, no nothing. No space materials required. You can build this in mid-game and then never have to interfere with it again. It will keep processing 10 kilos of crude oil forever. Uh, the counterflow heat exchanger here has been designed to be just long enough that no matter how bad the actual regular volcano you get, it will still run. Now, for minor volcanoes, we have this design over here. It is exactly the same in most regards, except the counterflow heat exchanger is a few stories longer, or it's twice the size, basically. This will do the exact same thing as the other design, except it will run on minor volcanoes. No matter how weak the minor volcano, it'll still run. Once you kick this on, it will run from start of the game to the end, no maintenance required. A quick mechanic to cover here is the magma blade. It's to do with how magma flows. If you just crack open one tile here, you'll see that the magma will actually extend out exactly 10 tiles. And the end tile is usually about 60 kilos of magma, give or take about five. This can be forced out to 11 tiles if there's enough uh, pressure here, as in you drop magma down on top of here. But we're gonna utilize this to actually control the flow of magma, so it's an important mechanic to have before I start this up. Okay, to start this up, we're just gonna flick this switch. This is effectively the on button. Well, the temporary on button. Once we turn that on, it allows the magma to actually flow in here and collect in this segment here. This is basically the magma dropper. And then once the magma is filled, I click this button again to go the opposite direction and it drops the magma down here into the tank. Now we actually have our uh, magma here that we can turn on our petroleum boiler. And to do that, I'll just flick the switch. This is uh, just something I set up to simulate oil coming up from the oil biome. And we turn that on and it flows through our counterflow heat exchanger. There's currently nothing to counterflow against, but... Now, once the crude oil hits the plate, I actually set this to 403 degrees. I don't turn this on beforehand because what happens is you end up superheating this in here and the first few drops of oil will turn into sour gas. Instead, I just wait until it's actually flowing. And that's it. You should never have to touch this again. If you stop sending crude oil in, it will just wait until you send in more. It won't actually do anything. Now, in the meantime, we're just going to deconstruct this. Now that's removed, the system resets, the next batch of crude oil, or the next batch of magma flows in. And that's basically it. Crude, the crude oil flows up here through the counterflow, the magma drops down here, and I'll just skip forward a bit until this is about ready to cycle out. Now, I've skipped forward in time until this first section of ma magma has almost been completely drained of useful heat. There's a temperature sensor hidden in there behind this igneous rock, and it is set to 430 degrees. Once the temperature in here goes below 430 degrees, we're going to cycle this magma out and get some fresh magma in. Uh, another way you can tell that it's starting to run out of heat is it's not actually converting all the crude oil as it comes in. This temperature sensor here is set to 403, and it's not actually able to convert the crude oil with the temperature coming in. However, that is not a problem because shortly now that will be cycled out. So. We'll crack open the automation overlay so you can see as well. It sends an automation signal up here to tell this automation, this miner to dig in. So let's have a, a quick look on a slower speed as it starts to actually manage itself. So the automation kicked in, it cracked open this bottom door. That's because we want all this igneous rock to fall down out of the system. We don't want it clogging things up. And then while it's doing that, this gate here is on a timer of 20 seconds. So once this 20 seconds have expired, it will open up this top door, dropping down the fresh magma. It will close this bottom door so that it can catch that falling magma. And it will also close this top door to stop any excess magma getting into the system. So we we'll just let that go away. Uh, as you can see, there's a, a bunch of crude oil in there accumulating, but very, very shortly we'll have enough magma. And there you can see this door closed, this door opened, this door closed. Magma drops down. And that starts injecting its fresh heat in there, and that will quickly convert all that crude oil that's accumulated right back up. This door has reopened, and fresh magma is pouring in. And that's it. It's a very simplistic design, or it's, well, it's as simplistic as I could make it. Uh, this system will run on precisely 629 grams of magma a second after it's warmed up. It will consume far more on the first couple of magma cycles. But after it's gone past about, say, the first four to eight tiles of magma, it'll even out at 626 grams a second. This is the minor volcano variant. This one is ex I exactly identical. It's got the same automation, same temperature settings, same everything. The only difference is the counterflow heat exchanger is longer so that we can 
recycle more of the heat. As the outgoing hot petroleum goes out, uh, we steal, well, we basically counterflow up with the crude oil and we absorb a bunch of the heat, so it takes less energy to heat the, the crude oil when it hits the plate. It costs about six tons of gold to make this variant and three tons of gold to make the other, give or take a little bit. This consumes roughly 316 grams of magma a second. So this will run on the weakest magma volcano, minor magma volcano you can find. While the design is technically maintenance free, there is one thing you will have to keep an eye on, and that is this mining drill. There's a drop of crude oil here to help uh, provide temperature transfer between these tiles and it. So, so long as you keep your liquid lock here, well, in contact with some atmosphere of some sort, this should never overheat. It will only activate and mine two tiles once every nine, 9.4 cycles or something like that. So it's going to generate very tiny amounts of heat. So long as you keep this cool, yeah, effectively maintenance free. Just make sure your base, let's say, doesn't go above 200 degrees. This should never have a problem. Torture tested the design for a couple hundred cycles, encountered one issue, and that was pressure damage right here on this tile. It was to do with the mass conversion of crude oil just before this cycled out. To compensate for that, I increased the temperature here to three, 435 degrees instead of 430. That extra five degree change in temperature reduces my safety margin from 6.5% to about 6%. Perfectly acceptable and well within regions. We have far less of a percentage chance on the or percentage safety margin on this build. Both of them have run flawlessly for the last 250 cycles. I have accumulated an enormous amount of petroleum from them, and neither of them have jammed up with rock segments or igneous rock tiles that can't be removed. Uh, occasionally when these do drop magma, a little bit of excess magma will drop, usually between 30 to 80 kilos. All worked into the math, it should be fine. The rest of the tutorial will be dedicated towards how to actually build or implement one of these in an actual survival game, uh, as well as that will cover some of the quirks and features that you should pay special attention to, because most of these, uh, like just say for example that drop there, it does have a reason, the metals you use, the, the materials it's made of, they all usually have a purpose of some sort. The temperature sensor here has not been changed. This one doesn't need it. It doesn't actually have any pressure. It never accumulates pressure damage, namely because the counterflow is longer. Therefore, the temperature differential is smaller and therefore the magma can actually keep up. Now, how to actually build this thing in an actual survival game. Now, full disclosure, I haven't built this in a survival game. My current petroleum boiler worked for me just fine and I haven't actually had a chance to play a new game yet where I'm going to implement it. But it's pretty straightforward to set one of these up. Uh, your best bet would be to find a volcano earlier rather than later, and that way you can start stockpiling magma for later use. So once you find a volcano, and usually just dig out one tile, you don't want to expose this to atmosphere just yet. Once you've realized what type of volcano you're dealing with, all you have to do is seal it up in a box like this. Just do not dig out the volcano yet. Then once you've got it sealed up in the box, it's time to vacuum out all the gases. You don't want to reveal it until you've got the gases out, because if it does erupt, well then you're in trouble. This is going to take a while, usually about five or six cycles, uh, because we're only using one gas pump. If you want, you could really get in there and put in a second gas pump, but unless you're in a huge hurry, it, it's not worth it. Uh, a second gas pump down here would definitely speed up the process, probably cut it down to about two or three days. Depending on what stage of the game you're at, you'll have access to different tech. If you don't have access to Atmo suits, you're probably not going to get a chance to analyze the volcano. Uh, the reason being, once you vacuum this out, you won't actually be able to, your duplicate will have to run in, start examining, and then run out again if you don't have an Atmos suit to put them in. If you do have Atmos suits, much simpler, you can usually get the volcano analyzed before it erupts. Now, uh, if you also don't have access to plastic yet, because you might be getting this set up in the first 80 to 80 cycles or so, then instead of using a high pressure gas vent, you can just put in a couple of gas reservoirs. You can research the tech and they don't require anything special, some copper ore, no problems. At this point, we're down to MCG. I'm not even sure what that stands for, but it does mean we're down to the point where it, it effectively starts to evaporate. If you'll see here, this whole area up here has become vacuum, and this bit down here is literally starting to just dissipate. It's uh, one of those vacuum mechanics of the game. Not exactly sure, but once you get down small enough, it all vanishes itself. Then once you've got it all vacuumed out, it's time to actually dig this sucker out. Uh, once you dig it out, clean up the floor. You don't want to leave any debris lying around. And then if you do have Atmos suits, you can get around to analyzing the volcano. However, it doesn't really matter too much. You just really don't want to get a volcano that's unusually, unusually low. 
well, you can actually seal this up or you can leave it open. The magma won't actually get up here high enough to interfere with this, so you can just leave these here if you want, or you can just dismantle a lot of them and extract them. This whole box is made out of obsidian. Uh, we use obsidian because of its ridiculously high melting point. That just ensures that we'll never have any problems with tiles melting. It's highly unlikely even with igneous rock, but I prefer to be safe rather than sorry. Standards. A couple of things I forgot to cover. It is eight tiles from the edge of this, uh, from the edge of the actual volcano to the edge of the right hand side wall. And it is eight tiles from just below the edge of the volcano to where you're going to build a second set of walls. And before you leave here, you're going to want to put in this tile here. This is to prevent the magma from flowing too far. We want to control the actual flow of magma so we don't overfill our magma dropper. Now, down here, we have the actual beginnings of the actual dropper and the boiler itself. Now, I configure it this way so that what you can do is you can drop a duplicate in here and they can actually navigate all the way through to the opposite side. This way you can actually get most of your building in here without having to worry too much and you can come in from both sides of the build. And we already have our liquid lock in place because we're going to turn this area into a vacuum to improve uh, the cooking potential, so to speak, and prevent the magma from uh, heating up everything in the area. Now, I'm going to rush through this, but I would advise you to do this at a slower pace so that you make sure you get everything right. But general theme is put it in, get it done, and get your temperature shift plates in. Uh, automation. tiles. Make sure these tiles are made out of gold, door made out of steel, and make sure your duplicate doesn't entomb themselves when they put that in there. They have a tendency to try and kill themselves a lot, as we've all noticed. Uh, window tiles made out of diamond. Uh, for everything in here as well, oh, for everything in here I'm also using uh, obsidian, uh, just because it's a standard at this point for me. And then you're going to want to put in all your automation. For your automation, you are going to need a memory toggle. If you'll notice, we've got some ladders on the outside as well. So you're going to want a memory toggle right about there. And then you're going to want automation wires to go to that. Automation wires to go there. Automation wires straight up. You will throw that into a filter gate. And then you will put in a knot gate. And we will set that to 20 seconds. Temperature sensor will be set to 430 degrees. Temperature sensor in here, we will set that to above. And that's the bulk of your automation done. Now, you will want to actually wall those in though. You don't want them being exposed. They will transmit heat and they'll do so quite handily. Now, automation wire up here. And one last trick we want to do. This is going to be our starter. Let's make sure this door stays closed until we are ready to kick off because we don't want any magma flowing in. And that's the bulk of it done, but next up you want to, next up we're going to want to cover how to actually get the oil up here. We're going to need an oil droplet to cool our mining drill that we want to put in here. Simplest thing to do, deconstruct this metal tile. This metal tile is made out of iron. You can really make them out of anything you want, to be honest, but uh, iron is cheap. Deconstruct that tile. Uh, we will summon a duplicate here to do this. Turn off auto build, turn off sandbox. And have the duplicate build, place the tile. If you notice, it causes the oil to splash up here. This gets us that droplet of oil we were looking for that is having to do anything too crazy. Thank you for your assistance. Now, of course, we do have to mop it all up again, so let's summon another duplicate for that section. Uh, now, if you'll notice, the duplicate only left the oil there. They somehow managed to scrub it off. That's perfectly normal. That's what we were expecting. And you notice that drop of oil that's there when they actually construct this door, hopefully before they die. The droplet of oil stays right there, which is exactly where we wanted it. This just allows us to get the oil in the place we want when we want it without having, having to actually open up a bunch of drippers. Then once that's done, we can just clean this out, deconstruct that tile, 
And now we have a droplet of oil right where we want, and we can auto close the door. And there we go. Droplet of oil exactly where we need it. Now, before we finish up, we do actually have to vacuum out this whole area. So, next up. At this point you're also going to run, run, run through your power cable from wherever your power supply is coming from in this case it's coming from way up here now uh one good thing to note about this is when you get anywhere close to these you're going to want to use steel for that run there those two tiles that's going to be steel same down here those last two tiles are going to be steel from down here you don't have to use steel for this section so you can get away with a lot of weaker stuff if you want and i usually would just run it down here pop that in and then everything in here is probably going to be steel up to there just to prevent any magma getting in uh, magma causing it to melt but this stretch down here you can make it copper gold whatever you want but you are going to want to use steel when you get in touching anything that's going to be in contact with the magma otherwise it will melt uh, so we're just going to simulate a bunch of gas being in here so that we can actually extract a lot of it this is a much smaller area, so it will be a lot quicker. Actually, I would also want to make sure that I had deconstructed those first. We want to get the gas out of here as well. Any oxygen, we don't want any oxygen being in this entire area, any gas at all. However, having a little bit of gas in there would not be the end of the world. It, it won't really cause too many problems. It's just going to keep rushing in there every time the door opens. Vacuum created. Time to actually clean up this and make sure that we have the whole system configured correctly before we uh, before we dis it before we move out we don't want to, to leave anything to chance at this point you once you seal this up you don't want to ever have to come back in here again now as the volcano erupts the reason we have this four tile drop is it provides some extra pressure down here and make sure we get some extra oomph into this magma blade to make sure it will actually pour down here otherwise i've tried this with i had a, a mishap let's say with a previous design where there was not enough drop space here and i didn't actually get full magma flow and it caused uh, the whole system to be a failure when building the counterflow heat exchanger, ladder scaffolds are your friend. Now, a good thing to note is the width of the heat exchanger is going to be right there. Just a quick note for yourselves. And then put in the actual radiant piping itself. So, all the way over, down one tile, all the way back, down one tile. One, two, three, and that's one, two, three, four stairs. Now, ladder scaffolds work in that the duplicate can stand here and can reach four tiles. So the duplicate standing here can place all these pipes themselves. Uh, the only annoying part here is you have to place that tile before you place this tile, otherwise they might try and do it in reverse and you won't be able to get in that last tile. Oh, and I made a minor mistake there. Habit. I originally tried this the other way around of keeping it in there, but uh, occasionally it would cause the tile to overheat when you turn, or this pipe to do an overheat when you actually switched off the boiler. So it's a good idea to actually make it take a quick left turn before you do that. That way it goes in that way. Also it gives you a nice reading on exactly how heated the petroleum is before it goes in. Now, once you've got that in, it's just a case of we are using igneous rock tiles here because it doesn't really matter what we use in here to be honest and igneous rock is usually quite plentiful. Now, then you would deconstruct these. Let's try that again. So deconstruct the buildings, get them out of the way. Then place in the next set of, the next set. Now, this last tank's actually pretty simple. Uh, you'll probably have to make sure you've got a ladder up there to get in. Actually, you can destroy that last chunk. Then it's just a case of putting in the actual plumbing itself. Uh, liquid pump. Radiant pipe. Uh, automation. Just make sure that the petroleum will get up to two levels before it starts pumping it out. It just gives us a bit of a heat sink. When you do turn this off, what will happen is the hot oil down here will start to keep flowing down. And since there's no counter flowing crude oil, this would start to heat up and you might have a problem with the steel pump overheating. So just having a little bit of a pool of cooled petroleum already there helps prevent that from happening. Then you're also going to want the output pipe for that. For insulated pipe, igneous rock is fine. We don't really care and here we're just going to dump this out but you would probably pump that off to your power supply or some sort of petroleum storage now you don't actually need to vacuum out this area but i would recommend that you only have one gas in there you can vacuum it out if you so feel like it but i consider it just a waste of time so instead 
I usually just simulate for this. I'm just simulating that uh, it's got a couple of kilos of oxygen in there. The reason you don't want to have mixed gases, though, is these gases will get compressed, and you don't want a blob of, say, carbon dioxide ending up in the middle here, stopping your counterflow heat exchanger from doing its job. One gas is good, two gases. One gas is fine, two gases is bad. At this point, we're almost ready to fire it up. I let the game run until the volcano had actually filled up this area. It's an actually legitimate test, so I wanted to make sure everything was as game would as would happen in a straightforward game. But we have two last things to do. One, we need to deconstruct this tile, and two, we need to put in the mining drill. We can't put in the mining drill yet because we need that ladder segment there so that the duplicate can get up and help us deconstruct this tile. That is why we have put in these ladder segments here and left everything the way it is. Oh, come on. Okay, so that gets that deconstructed. That allows us to get a that allows us to actually get the system to the point where we can operate it. Uh, now, one last thing, we're going to need to put in a mining drill as well. We're building it on top of a door. Game doesn't care. Okay, at this point, we're going to want to actually put it in, and we just simply arrange it on the door. Now, this is a bit finicky. They've got to actually pick it up, and boom, there you go. Uh, occasionally they have problems where they, they lose track of where they are or what they're doing when because when the door opens it actually resets where they actually are located. Well, it resets the building. They can't place it while the door is open. But by and large, send the duplicate in and out a couple of times. I'll get the hang of it. And that's how you construct it in a survival game. Now, a couple of mistakes I made along the way. I actually ran that cable down there first uh, straight through that door. That was a problem that was interfering with the door, so I just moved it back here. And I also forgot to place in that uh, automation wire when I was building it as well. It, high speed builds you're going to mess up a few things so do take your time make sure you've got everything set up and that's it done and dusted you're ready to go and fire up this design at this point i want to cover uh, material choices if you'll notice the metal tiles here they're made of gold and they need to be made of gold we're i'm running some pretty fine margins on this to make sure that this will run on any volcano so this is where specific heat capacity becomes an issue so what I want to demonstrate here is the differences between using, say, gold versus uh, another material like steel or tungsten, or steel or diamond. Uh, for example here, when this door engages, we're going to check what the overheat is. Currently, this is very, very hot magma, and we can't actually, due to the inefficiencies in the system, we can't figure out exactly how much temperature to inject. The door does not engage, disengage fast enough, uh, and as well as that, the magma is so hot, it's just dumping too much heat in. So if you'll notice here, this has actually gone up to 408.9. Yeah, it maxed it at 408.9 degrees, which is quite a bit over the 403 we were targeting. However, we're using gold. If we were to, say, cycle this out, uh, let's deconstruct these and replace that with another metal, something with a different specific heat capacity. OK, in this instance, I'm going to pick copper namely because copper is so similar to gold in many respects the only difference between gold and copper is their actual specific heat capacity it's 60 thermal conductivity 0.129 for specific heat capacity 60 thermal conductivity 0.385 for specific heat capacity that's the only difference between the two materials and what we're going to do is just fast forward this a little bit and then we're going to see how much the temperature spikes when the next heat injection takes place okay so we started injecting temperature and it's 10.9, 11.9, 12.7, 13.3. All okay, right, so it maxes out about 13.3. So that that difference between a copper tile and a gold tile is we dump an enormous amount more heat into the system than we wanted to. That's why it's so important. That That's why specific heat capacity is very important in some areas. Now, when it comes to the actual injection of heat down here, this is less important so to speak this is not going to cause such a massive problem the reason we use diamond is diamond actually has a very good thermal conductivity we're not concerned about taking heat out of this too fast we want to be able to drain heat all the way down as low as possible so using diamond allows us to get down to the 430 degrees to squeeze the maximum amount of heat out if we use steel or tungsten or gold well actually steel and tungsten are your only two choices really bar diamond when you're dealing with magma if we use those they won't actually be quite as efficient at pulling the heat out. That's why we use diamond down here. Now, I come in here from the top when it comes to getting access to volcanoes for a couple of reasons. One, it gives me a shorter trip to get to analyze the volcano, but more importantly, if it's later in the game when you find your volcano and it's a minor one, let's say, or it's taking a long time to fill up on magma, what you can do is you can put three bottle emptiers in here and take geothermal magma from the bottom of the map and dump it in here to help speed up 
getting that uh, magma tank up to the necessary size because you do need a decent chunk of magma to start. This way you can just basically get a jump start if you get delayed getting around to your minor volcano. That's why we come in from the top. Now I made the claim that these magma boilers would work on any volcano of the given type. However, I'm not basing it on the least, uh, I'm not basing it on the wiki, let's say. I'm basing it on the maps page. For example, here is the output of a volcano at most 68, 0.68 kilos per second. And there was only two volcanoes in existence that have been found on the map storage site. The map storage site holds about 44,320 maps and change. And of those, only two are that weak. This is the weakest one on record at 675 grams a second. My petroleum boiler will work at 627 grams a second, as low as that. So even if a volcano comes along that's weaker than this, it should still be able to handle it so long as it doesn't go below 627 grams a second. My advice would be analyze your volcano, go to the calculator and try and figure it out yourself. If it's below 627 grams a second, then okay, you've got a problem, but it seems highly unlikely one of those should appear. Uh, next up, we've got minor volcanoes. These are the four weakest ones in existence, and this one here is the weakest one ever found among uh, like 40,000 maps, 326 grams a second. My petroleum boiler can handle 316 grams a second and still function, so yeah. There is a possibility that a minor volcano might show up at some point that's weaker than this, but I consider it highly unlikely. Now, trying to figure out the efficiency of these designs was a nightmare. The numbers don't add up. No matter what I did with the calculator, could not figure out what was going on. Uh, according to this design, the only way I could figure it out in the end was to actually work out how much magma was being consumed and compare that to how long it took for it to consume it, and that was telling me how, what the consumption rate was. This design here consumes 316 grams of magma a second, and according to the calculator, that means I should be raising the temperature of the petroleum when it hits the plate by 24 degrees. However, the petroleum is com coming in about 9 degrees, 9 or 10 degrees short of what it needs to be, so somehow 14 degrees of temperature application are disappearing. I I gave up in the end, I just I decided to just do practical testing. It was the only way to realistically determine to realistically determine the actual consumption rates. Now, if someone else wants to go and play around with these, I've got a test map here where it's just running different length counterflow heat exchangers. The uh, igneous rock collects at the bottom and you can measure the igneous rock, temperature, all that kind of stuff. Uh, these tiles down here are all made out of insulation so you can get an accurate temperature reading from the actual output. Uh, at the bottom of all of these, you'll find a little temperature sensor. And all I've done is I've set how many grams per second each particular one uses, just to, if you want to compare your numbers with, that you get with, with the ones I get. Anyway, uh, if you do want to enjoy this, it's in the description. I'll put a link in the description of the video and help yourself. As a final note, the, the, the testing and determining of how many grams per second were used have kind of put a nail in the coffin of using a metal volcano as a reasonable source of heat for petroleum boiling. I am going to do some testing into it. Maybe it transfers heat better. Maybe there's less loss. But if the loss of heat to magma is any indication, it would the counterflow heat exchanger would be half the size of the map to make one of those work. I'll see if I can get one working, but I doubt it would be of a practical size. Anyway, hope you enjoyed this tutorial, or I hope it gave you at least some good information. These two particular designs here should be fairly useful. They're reasonably compact, do the job, minimal material requirements. Yeah, hope they serve you well.